Hello, hello. Welcome to the Creative Women Wanted podcast. I am so, so, so excited about this podcast because I'm going to be talking about seven of the best things that I've watched this year so far and three of the worst three of the absolute worst, okay? Um, but I'm Diamond Williamson. I'm a director who creates, produces, and directs story about Black women and for Black women. And I do that through my production company called Third and Wonder. Um, like I said, I'm really excited about this podcast because I get to talk. I just get to talk about my favorite things, TV, spirituality, and books with women who love what I love, with women who love television, who love documentaries, who create television, who create documentaries, and women who love books, all right? So I want to start off with talking about, um, we're doing this quick little segment, it's a quick little segment called What I'm Watching. And I am currently binging Downton Abbey. And Sydney thinks it is absolutely the most boring and horrific show. That was me trying to do an accent. <laughs> the most boring show ever, but I love it. I am newly into period pieces after watching HBO's Max, HBO Max's uh, The Gilded Age, which is actually created by the same creator for Downton Abbey. Um, Downton Abbey was released in 2010, and Downton Abbey really globalized, globalized and popularized period pieces. It really made them okay and exciting to green light. And so I'm digging in. I love it. I'm on season three. I'm trying to watch it before it leaves Netflix, but it is really, really, really juicy. I think I didn't think I'd be so interested in like what they have going on across the pond. All right. And there's another segment that I want to include in these episodes, and it's called What I'm Learning. And so what I'm learning is that I have to work on the stories that I'm telling myself. There is a voice that I mentioned in episode one and two, and this has been something that's really prominent in my life right now, is that there's this voice that I have, that we all have, that really comes in and tells us things, you know, things that may be helpful, that may not be. The untethered soul calls it the roommate. I call my voice Stacy. She's always anxious. She's always eager. And most of the time, she's really not helpful. Like, I get it. She's on a mission, right? She wants a great life for me. Um, but she's really rigid on how we should achieve that life. Um, and I get that, right? But in this season, I'm working on being more fluid. Like, fluidity works, too. Like, I've always kind of lived or, you know, before the last four years, I really lived very, like, I got to do all these things in order to reach this milestone, which is going to help me reach the ultimate goal, but not realizing how much of this work is spiritual. And how much of this work I have to let God do. And it's not just about what I do on my own. And that means I have to pay attention to what the voice is saying. And I have to sort of disregard it or disarm it or really find the facts that proves that that voice is lying to me. Because some of the things that Stacy would say that I would believe to be fact were like, you can't start a podcast. You're a TV director. Again, this is the voice in my mind saying you shouldn't eat at the same place every morning. You need to eat at home. You don't need to talk about TV and spirituality in your podcast. Talk about one or the other. Like that doesn't make sense. And she is so annoying. Like she's annoying at this point. And I've let her tell me lies and make me anxious too long. And ignoring that voice is how, I've, how I made it to even three podcast episodes of this. Because I did three podcasts and they were good. They were good. One of them, I made three podcasts in 2010 and one of them was reviewing Little Fires Everywhere. And it was like, I had Little Fire, Little Fire Everywhere clips in it. Like it was fire. Okay. Um, but I decided not to listen any longer to that. And had I did, I wouldn't be here. I still be wanting to do the podcast versus actually doing it. So now we're going to get into the meat, the juice of the podcast, which are the seven best things that I've watched this year so far, and three of the absolute worst. And I have some honorable mentions. But first up is Severance. Severance is twisty, okay? So um, how like it's described on the internet is that it's a sinister technology corporation, Lumen Industry. It uses a severance medical procedure to separate the non-work memories of some of their employees from their work memories. So basically they would go to work and be doing this very, doing these very monotonous tasks, but they didn't, but they didn't, they only knew their work life. So when they would go down the elevator, things would change for them and they would become these 
their outies, their outer, their outer selves, and not have any idea anything about what was going on. But you could tell most of their outies were really depressed and unhappy. But one severed employee, Mark, gradually uncovers a web of conspiracy from both sides of the division. Um, and the thing about severance is that I wanted to try it, um, but I didn't try it until somebody on set when we were creating for Google was like, you got to watch it. It's so good. He explained it because the trailer ain't doing no justice. Okay. But once I watched severance and I got into like three, even the first episode got to the end of the first episode, Sydney was asleep at the end of the first episode. Okay. Y'all, she just wasn't into it at first. But when I got to the first episode, I was like, mind blown like it is so good i've never seen anything like this ben stiller is the director you know i'm really used to him in comedy but he directed the series and i mean it's it's really juicy it starts off kind of quirky right because you're like what is going on but you just have to give severance time um yeah, you just have to give Severance time, but it's definitely one of my favorite scripted shows. I'm excited. I'm excited about season two. Um, and I just don't think we've seen anything like Severance. All right. My next, one of my next favorites that I've watched so far this year is The Rise and Fall of Abercrombie, the documentary on Netflix. Um, so why Hot, The Rise and Fall of Abercrombie, details the store's success and controversies, including its racist and exclusionary practices. The documentary focuses on the rise and popularity of the brand after the arrival of CEO Mike Jeffries in 1992. Um, so the documentary also explores its toxic culture, featuring interviews with some of the original participants in the class action lawsuit. So it's nostalgic. I mean, the documentary is de definitely nostalgic in the best way because I do remember Abercrombie being very, um, very expensive. Um, I used to like to go in there and I used to always kind of feel guilty for being in there because it's like, I don't see any of myself in here. I couldn't, I knew I couldn't buy anything. I knew that all of the white girls had it on at school. Um, but I feel like the documentary validated a lot of the way that I felt as a child and didn't know that I felt that way, right? But at the end of the day, I preferred Hollister anyway. Um, but I do also think that we don't see a lot of documentaries on clothing brands, especially clothing brands from when we were children. Like Von Dutch tried to do a documentary series and I thought it was awful. I thought it was awful. I tried to watch the first episode, but it moved too fast and it went too many different directions. I think that they needed to slow down um, because it was confusing and all over the place. I'll say one thing I really liked though about the Abercrombie documentary is that, you know, they had reliable sources. I like that they were able to bring in people who participated in that class action lawsuit because when I was younger or when the lawsuit was actually going on, I didn't know anything about it. I had no clue that these things were going on. I was just going into this store, hoping one day that I would be able to afford it. Um, and so I do think that they were able to share information that a lot of us didn't know, which made it really good. And I think that's what makes great documentaries, of course, is like giving us the juice, giving us the inside scoop about, you know, things that we didn't necessarily know. So that was one of my favorites. Um, one of my other favorites was the dropout. I loved the dropout. I didn't think I would like the dropout because I'm really tired of Hollywood making shows about white criminals. Like I really, really am. Um, but the dropout is based on the ABC audio podcast about the rise and fall of Elizabeth Holmes and her company Theranos. Now I had already seen the documentary, uh, The Inventor on HBO Max, and it was stellar. It was so brilliant. It was so well done. It was so juicy and criminal. Like I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but the podcast touched on experiences that likely motivated Holmes' decisions and lies in a linear fashion, starting from when she was younger, when she was in, uh, when she was a teenager, to when she was in college, to when you know she ended up launching the company. And I think that what I really like about this uh, show, The Dropout, is that it really does. It highlights things that they don't necessarily talk about in the news. Like we know that she's on trial right now, right? Or that she was on trial. And we don't have to see that in, in the show, The Dropout. But it really gives perspective to some of the other voices that were affected 
by what Elizabeth Holmes did. It humanized the other characters. It humanized her business partner. It humanized the grandson of one of her board members. It humanized the young woman who was a whistleblower. It humanized the people who were in the lab, you know, um, and humanized the guy who ended up committing suicide as a result of the things that Elizabeth Holmes was doing. And it's so, it's so unfortunate that companies like this could raise so much money. I mean, at some point it was valued at a billion dollars and Walgreens had given them so much money, Walgreens, for a company that ended up being one big house of cards. It's really kind of crazy, but the dropout, it's scripted. Um, I forget the young lady who is the actress, Amanda, I believe, I forget her name, but she was so good. She got a lot of Elizabeth manner, a lot of Elizabeth's mannerisms. Um, great. She got them down so amazing. And the director was a woman. So I think that because the director was a woman, it was really soft. It didn't feel so businessy. It felt very human. And that's what I appreciated about The Dropout. It was a good story um, from beginning to end. Um, and so if you need a little something to watch, head over to Hulu. It's a Hulu, a Hulu original and it's called The Dropout. My next favorite and like it's been one of the best that I've watched for the last six years. It is This Is Us. And I know... Oh my God. It's like one of the best shows ever. Like, like seriously, I'm not even kidding. You know, so This Is Us is a series that follows the lives of siblings, Kevin, Kate, and Randall, known as the Big Three. Big Three. Big Three. And their parents, Jack and Rebecca Pearson. It takes place mainly in the present, but it uses flashbacks and flash forwards to show other significant moments in the family histories. And it's, it's I'm, I'm telling you, it's literally some of the best storytelling ever. If you haven't watched one episode of This Is Us, I really want to encourage you to watch the pilot because I've been watching the show since the beginning, since the pilot aired. And it was so good. Like, it's just really excellent storytelling. And if you like that kind of mind bending uh, Shutter Island uh, Inception type, like what? This show is that. And it's the transitions for me. It's the life lessons for me. And the thing about This Is Us is that it's literally some of the best writing in the world because to have a type of vision that flashes forward and flashes back and then tells it in the present and does that over the entire six seasons, I mean, come on. Like, it's really good. And I think there's always a lesson to be learned. And yes, we always cried. We all we, we cried every single episode because, it, and it's not about the show making you cry. It's about how relatable it feels. It's about how, like, how seen I feel from the show and how drawn to these characters I feel. Like, I just feel for them so much because I'm so deeply connected to them. My favorite character was definitely definitely Randall. I loved Randall. I loved that he had his his black wife that they met in college and that, you know, he, he had his kids and that he adopted, you know, Beth Pearson. Beth Pearson is one of the best Pearsons out here, okay? She's so real. And I love that he adopted a young girl very similar to his own story. And that he relentlessly pursued politics to the end of the show to where he might even be president. Like they seeded that idea for us. And I thought that was really beautiful. Randall's story was just so empowering to see him as a dad, to see him as a dad when his daughters are dating and to see him as a dad when his daughter is coming out of the closet. I mean, they touched on so many subjects to see him as a husband, right? To see his wife, you know, trying to pursue his her dream while he's trying to pursue his. And of course, um, uh, Kevin and Kate had really beautiful stories as well. Um, they talked about eating disorders and obesity and adoption and uh, drinking. I mean, it's post-World War, you know, stress disorder. Like, I don't know the exact terms, forgive me for that. Uh, but it's PTSD in general, right? But like, it's just so good. And I really do believe that if you want something good to binge, This Is Us is really an incredible series. Next up is, is it cake? 
Mikey Day, he hosts a baking competition. I think Mikey Day is on SNL. Um, he hosts a baking contest during which skilled cake artists create mouth-watering replicas of handbags, sewing machines, and other objects. It's kind of crazy. They make suitcases. They make cash registers. Like, it's wild. So why this show is on my list, um, one thing you should know about me is that I watch all of the food competition shows, okay? I love Top Chef. I love, okay, am I lying? I don't watch all of them. But I love Top Chef. I love Spring Baking Championship. I love Kids Baking Championship. I love Halloween Baking Championship. Like, I love, um, what's that one on Netflix? What's the one on Netflix that I love? Yeah, I love Great British Bake Off. I love it. Um, I'm obsessed. And it's funny because, like, you ain't going to see me just making these very elaborate baked goods. I like to bake, but you're not going to see me really ever creating art out of it. But I love them and I love food competitions and I really love the art of food. I love that something so delicate and delicious can be made into art. Like I follow the really cool baking pages and the chocolatiers on Instagram. Um, and that's why I was obsessed with this show ultimately. I already watch compilation of videos on bakers on YouTube. So to see it in a show format is really fun. And I can't even lie, I can't even lie to you. And you're not gonna believe me, but it's true. I identified most of the cakes. I was able to say that is the cake. And I think that's what makes it, I think that's what makes the show fun is that it's 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 unexpectedly interactive because now I'm like, that's the cake, that's the cake. No. And Sydney's like, no, that's the cake. I promise that's the cake. Like, and it's it's just really fun. And I really enjoyed the celebrity guests. I think the casting did really great because they picked celebrities that were really into it that were really competitive as well. So Is a Cake is fun. It's a nice series on Netflix. It's just something really, really fun to watch. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. My next one is The Gilded Age on HBO Max. So The Gilded Age, um, the American Gilded Age was a period of immense economic change, great conflict between the old ways of doing things and the new systems, and huge fortunes were made and lost. And so in 1882, young Marianne Brooke moves from rural Pennsylvania to New York City after the death of her father to live with her aunts, Agnes Van Rijn and Ada Brooke, accompanied by Peggy Scott, who is a Black woman. She's also an inspiring writer, and they're seeking a fresh start. So inadvertently, this young Marianne becomes enmeshed. This is what the internet is saying, enmeshed in a social war between her aunt Van Ryan, who was of the old New York, and the new New York, which is George and Bertha Russell. And they are messy. They are so messy. I didn't think I would like the I didn't think I would like the show, but I watched the pilot. Um, and it's really, it's really good because ultimately Marianne must choose if she will follow the established rules of society or forge her own path. You know, it blew my mind because I can't believe how hooked and invested I was in the show. And the reason I even watched The Gilded Age was because I really tend to like most of HBO's originals. They have a great success rate for, with me. And so I've been giving their new shows a try. I also heard that they were the creators of Downton Abbey and I knew how popular Downton Abbey was. I knew that it was a phenomenon, what was considered to be a phenomenon as a, of a show. So I gave it a try and I wanted to try something different. And now I'm invested in The Gilded Age. Um, they tell a really delicate story of race, a really delicate story of class. Um, and I think it's interwoven really beautifully. And I love this idea of like old New York versus new, um, new New York. And one of the main characters is from the good fight. Um, so and the good wife, so really, really good show. I definitely re recommend watching the Gilded Age. If you like Bridgerton, if you like the crown, you'll probably like the Gilded Age. And if you're a fan of HBO Max originals, I would definitely suggest giving this a try. So next up, next up. It comes from our girl, our girl, Shonda Rhimes. It is not Bridgerton. It is Inventing Anna. So Inventing Anna is, Inventing Anna is about a journalist who investigates the case of Anna Delvey, the Instagram legendary heiress who stole the hearts and money of New York elites. So I remember this story from 2020 or from ABC News, one of them. Um, and when I found out that Shonda was the brains behind the series, I was already invested. So I had just heard, like, I had just read the press release and I was like, I'm good. It's always interesting, though, what I'll say about shows and what I'll say about just Shonda is like seeing established characters in other shows embody new characters. So at first, like during the first episode of Inventing, of Inventing Anna, it was hard to see our good old girl Ruth Langmore from Ozark. 
it was hard to see her as Anna. I could still hear that little country twang that Ruth had in Ozark, but eventually those, it was no more Ruth because the actress playing Anna and Ruth, Julia Garner played Anna so well. And I love how the story told it from the journalist's point of view. So we got to see how the journalist was unfolding this investigation and writing about it and getting, you know, collecting information from her sources while we got to see, you know, Anna's story it play out in real time. So I thought that was good. I liked being able to see the newsroom and see how the story was developed and experience the journalist's reactions and emotions the same way we were reacting and, and um, kind of like being astonished by what was happening. And I can't believe she almost got away with that. I can't even lie. What I also liked about the show, though, was the luxuriousness, though. I think that we all love like aspirational TV to an extent, which is why like Selling Sunset and Selling Tampa is so popular is this idea of like beautiful things and aspirations um, and inventing Anna felt very rich. It was very juicy and criminal. You know how you know how they do. Um, but it was it was good. It was good. So that was seven. That was seven of the best things that I've watched so far this year. Now I got to get into the worst. One of the worst things that I watched this year was definitely Bad Vegan. It was so annoying that I didn't even finish and that I would not talk any more about it, but it was just so boring. It was so boring and dry, and I really feel like it just lacked, um, like, like it just wasn't following the the arc, the story arc thing, you know what I mean? Like, rising conflict, it was so boring by... One of the worst things I also watched, which I think is surprising for people to hear me say, is Ozark. Ozark was so terrible this season. Why? Because it was too messy and it got too complicated. And spoiler alert, why did Ruth have to die? Why can't we just have a happy ending? After everything that Ruth went, went through, why couldn't she just live and see this dream out? But Wendy gets away? I do not. When I tell you, I don't even want to watch anything with Wendy in it because Wendy was so evil. And I'm so mad that she got away with it. I'm done with Jason Bateman. I'm done with Lauren, with Laura, whatever her name is. I'm done. Ozark was horrible this year. And the absolute worst thing that we watched this year, and I had to ask Sydney because I wanted to like make sure I put the worst things on there, on this, on this list, on this podcast. I'm like, Sydney, what's one of the worst things we watched? And she was like, Yellow Jackets. And I was like, yes, ding, ding, ding. Yellow Jackets was so drawn out boring like I couldn't follow it like I just think that they kept trying to like make these big climactic moments that were not climactic at all and I think it was very hyped up the trailers were hyping it up so much and they hooked me every single episode but by the towards the end I was like I didn't believe in them anymore and then episode 10 I was like no nah, nope I'm not ready for season two it's just too quirky and weird for me I'm done with yellow jackets I don't suggest watching it I am going to get into really quickly, though, um, some honorable mentions. Um, the first lady. All right. Despite our girl, my girl specifically, Viola Davis, that said black Twitter, you know, into like chaos with all of her quirks. The show is really done well. And it's about these three first ladies, Eleanor Roosevelt, Betty Ford and Michelle Obama and their journey before, during and I think after their tenure as first ladies. Um I think it's good because I think they chose really like women who were first ladies during very pivotal moments in American history. Um, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, she had to deal with scandal. You know, her husband was cheating. He was he was sick. He was ill. They had to do with they had to deal with things post World War Two and the horrors of World War Two. Um, and she saw that she needed that there were things that she needed to do. She wanted to be a different type of first lady. And then Betty Ford, her husband wasn't voted into office he was inaugurated after Richard Nixon resigned right so it's like what's that journey look like she wasn't prepared for it it's not like she was campaigning so we get to see a little bit of that and then Michelle Obama of course of course the first lady on the show that we actually got to experience um, that most of us got to experience and we know what she went through first black first lady racism a majority republic congress um, a traditional White House staff that wasn't used to Black women, let alone an ambitious, hardworking Black woman with a vision, right? They tried to put Michelle in a box, but la, nah, that's not how it works. And we get to see that replay out. 
Um, and I think the other honor honorable mention was, of course, the Adele concert because Oprah don't play with her. She got to be on the list in some way. But that's it. That's seven of my best shows uh, that I watched this year and three of the absolute worst that I just did not like and would not recommend. Now, if you like this podcast, if you can relate, if you liked any of the shows or loved any of the shows like I did, if your worst were my worst or if, if my worst were your favorites, let me know in the comments why you thought those shows were great or why you agree with my list. Leave a comment and give it five stars. I want more people to listen. I want to have more of these conversations and I want to know what you think in general. That's all for now.